Good morning. I'm Carlos Fernandez, Public Policy Manager of the Vegas Chamber. I'd like to thank you all for tuning into Eggs and Issues, featuring U.S. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Before we get started, I want to take some time to explain some features of this call. In order to preserve high sound quality, we'll be muting everyone on the call besides the presenters to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you'd like to ask a question, there are a few ways you can do so. If you're in this call on the web or through the mobile app, you can ask a question by using chat feature on the interface. We'll ask a question on your behalf. You can also ask a question by clicking the hand raise button on the interface. We'll call your name and unmute your line so you can ask a question. Once you have asked a question, we'll read your line so the call can get the answer. And to preserve time, we ask that you please keep questions brief and we'll be taking all questions at the end of the call. Now, please welcome the Vegas Chamber President and CEO, Mayor Betsy Wald. Thank you so much, Carlos. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Eggs and Issues today with US Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. In just a few minutes, we're gonna hear from Senator Cortez Masto about the very latest from Washington, DC. And of course, about any issues that could be impacting your business like a Future Cares Act. Um, we are grateful that so many of you are convening with us today by video and by phone. While we've all been doing our very best to stay open and stay safe, the Vegas Chamber has continued to provide you with the latest information and resources to help you operate your businesses. Before we get into the program, I want to highlight just a couple of uh, upcoming Vegas Chamber programs for you. Be sure not to miss our annual installation luncheon. That's coming up this Thursday, December 10th. Can't believe we're already there. That's an opportunity for you to hear what's ahead for the Vegas Chamber from our new chairwoman, Gina Bon Jovi, and you can also meet the entire board of 20, 2021 trustees. This is also going to be a virtual event as well, so everybody can attend, so please be part of our celebration, and to sign up, you can go to VegasChamber.com. The Chamber is also hosting a series of webinars in January that are meant to update you on some of the key issues coming up during our legislative session that could potentially negatively impact your businesses. As business owners and operators, it's super important to know what's at stake and how you can help and how you can be a voice for the business community. So look for a schedule uh, in the upcoming Vegas Chamber weekly newsletter and please do make a commitment to be part of it. Please let us know also how we can serve you. We're always looking for new opportunities and new ways to serve our business community through the Vegas Chamber. And now it is my absolute honor to introduce Vegas Chamber Chairman of the Board of Trustees. He's also the president of Craig and Pike, Mr. Tom Burns. Hi, Tom. Good morning, Mary Beth. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you all for attending. Uh, in a few moments, we're gonna hear from Senator Cortez Mastos on uh, leading issues going on in Washington, DC. Uh, the Senator and I both attended the University of Nevada, Reno, at the same time, and somehow the Senator didn't age, and I cannot have, take, take that same claim. <laughs> so it's good to have you on, Senator. You know, this uh, Vegas Chamber's top priority in, is representing your business at all levels of government. And we know how these regulations impact your business, uh, and the Chamber is here to support you during these trying times. We have several dignitaries to call on today, and I want to recognize. Re, uh, Regent Laura Perkins from the Nevada System of Higher Education, uh, Chairman Marilyn Kirkpatrick from the County Commission, Chairwoman Paula Goins Brown from the City of North Las Vegas, Mayor Deborah March from the City of Henderson, Councilwoman Michelle Romero from the City of Henderson. I also want to recognize a number of members of the Board of Trustees from the Chamber Mike Bolanini, Gina Bon Jovi, Teresa DiLoretto. Michael Federer, Betsy Fretwell, Lisa Halfield, Ellen Schuhofer, Larry Singer, and Vicki Van Mietren. And as always, uh, Mary Beth Sewell, the greatest asset of the, of the chamber, no doubt. Uh, delivery quality programs like Eggs and Issues take sponsors, and we're proud to have the support of many local businesses here in Southern Nevada. And I'd like to represent or uh, recognize our presenting sponsor, Cox Communication, along with other additional sponsors. Allegiant Airlines, AMR Medic West, GC Wallace, the Howard Hughes Corporation, NV Energy, the Porter Group, Southwest Gas, Sunrise Health System, Switch, and Toro University. We'd like to thank them for the support of Eggs and Issues and the Chamber as we've gone on throughout this year. Now I'm going to turn it over to Craig Stevens, the Senior Manager of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Cox Communications to introduce Senator Mastos. Thank you for the introduction, Tom. And be remiss to say that I, I wanna thank you for your leadership over this last year. I know it's been trying and difficult, but you've done an amazing job and um, we just really appreciate how hard you've, you've been working for all the businesses here in the state. 
So it's my honor today to introduce U.S. Um, Senator um, Catherine Cortez Masto. Senator Cortez Masto has a distinguished career in public service, as we all know. She served as two terms as Nevada's Attorney General and has been a strong advocate for women, children, and seniors since her time as a prosecutor. In November of 2016, she was the first one from Nevada and the first Latina elected to the United States Senate. She continues to advocate for women's rights and health care. Senator Cortez Masso also sits on five Senate committees, including the Committee on Finance, the Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, and the Committee on Rules and Administration, and the Committee on Indian Affairs. Senator Cortez Masso currently serves as a ranking member of the Economic Policy Subcommittee of the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, and the ranking member of the Water and Power Subcommittee of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Uh, Craig, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, reaching out to you from Washington, D.C. I just uh, told Mary Beth I am not leaving here until we have a COVID package. Uh, let me just say thank you to Mary Beth, to Tom, and the entire board at the chamber and the staff. And then to all my friends that I heard, uh, a shout out for each one of you and everyone else who's on the call today. Thank you for your continued engagement with my office. Uh, I, I truly believe uh, I am your voice here in Washington. And the only way that we can get something done is I have to hear from you. We have to engage all the time, talk about what's impacting our businesses. I know uh, after working in uh, Nevada, born and raised there, my parents are small business owners that um, our small business owners are the backbone of the economy. And right now, so many are struggling because of this healthcare pandemic. And we need to make sure that um, you, when we are able to come out of this pandemic, we, we really stem the spread of this virus, that our economy bounces back that much quicker. That's why we have to make investments now in our businesses and our small businesses. Uh, and that's the purpose of so many of the packages that we passed here in Congress. There's been five so far. Uh, probably the most prominent you all are aware of is the CARES Act and then the supplement after that. There's because of the, the support and bipartisan support, let me say, and very quickly, we moved it out the door. Um, there's about $19 billion that came into the state of Nevada uh, and in and, and, and so many different forms. Um, and now we see what is happening. We are running out of, of those funds. The pandemic is still there. It is hitting us hard. The vaccine's around the corner, but it's not there yet. Uh, so we need to do another investment. We need uh, another relief package. And that's the, the impetus of why so many of us are staying here in Washington. There's a bipartisan bill on the way. And um, I'm hopeful that it gets on the floor of the Senate. Many are working uh, through oh, the weekend. We've worked through the weekend. We've worked to put language to the very specific dollar amount that everybody agreed to um, in this bipartisan group, um, about $908 billion. Uh, and now the language hopefully is coming out this week so we can uh, look at it even further to see the impacts it's gonna have. But really COVID relief before we leave here before the end of the year, an appropriations bill that we have to pass, our timing up for that is December 11th. Uh, and instead of doing a continuing resolution, we need to pass it. And so there's talk of an omnibus bill right now. If we can't get that omnibus bill by December 11th, I'm hearing a small continuing resolution for one week until we can get it in. And then the third piece of legislation that we have to pass before the end of the year is uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, and that is something that um, it looks like we are going to be able to move it in a bipartisan way through Congress. The question will be whether the president vetoes it or not. So that's kind of on the table for us before the end of the year. And then I promise you, uh, as we go into the new Congress and the new um, uh, administration, um, there is going to be a constant dialogue with this new administration. I am meeting with the transition team this week to set the priorities that I have for all of us in Nevada after hearing from you and so many people in the state of Nevada. This is gonna be something that I want the ad new administration to be focusing on with your entire uh, delegation in the state of Nevada to make sure that um, we are not left behind. We have been so hard hit, the hospitality, travel, leisure industry from trade shows to conventions uh, really has not had a benefit from um, a, a much of the CARES Act money. And so we have to make sure that we are putting 
um, practices in place, whether it's tax code relief or it is investment in dollars coming in immediately relief, we have to do that. We either have to do it in this package in the short term or in a long term in another package that we might have to be looking at. So that's where we are. I look forward to the conversation today uh, with all of you. And uh, thank you again for the, the invitation to speak with you this morning. Henry, once again, thank you for being here. We're, we're very happy to have you uh, get your input and your insight into what's going on in Washington, DC. In a few moments, we'll be asking the Senator a few questions. For our members that wanna ask questions, if you're joining this call, you can ask a question through a couple of different methods. First, you can do the hand raise button, we'll unmute you. You ask the question and we'll ask you to mute yourself again, or you can use the chat future, uh, feature on, this, on the Zoom call. So Senator, um, you, you indicated uh, uh, that you're not going home until the COVID bill is passed. What do you think that takes to pass before the end of the year? Well, the good news is we have a bipartisan support for it. Everybody uh, that I have talked to has come out for it. We have a top line dollar, $908 billion. And so, and, and, and we know kind of the areas, it's comprehensive enough that it will inject relief into um, our, our communities immediately from money for state and local tribal, more money for unemployment insurance, a, along with pandemic unemployment insurance, more money for small businesses and the PPP idle, money for restaurants, uh, for stages, uh, more money that goes into CDFIs and MDIs for community lender support, more tr money for transportation, uh, of course, money for vaccine development, distribution, testing, and tracing. We still have to focus on the healthcare piece of this. And then additional money for education, for student loans, for housing assistance. We all know we're seeing what, what's happening in our state right now for nutrition assistance. We see the long lines for the food insecurity. There's money for childcare. There's money for broadband. Um, so uh, it is pretty comprehensive. It is, is it completely everything we need? Probably not. This is gonna be a short-term fix. What I'm hearing is working with the new administration. We'll do a short-term for four months. We'll see what else is needed. And then the new administration is willing to work with us on another package. So I look at this as kind of short-term and long-term uh, what our goals are. My focus right now, I will tell you, is uh, really what I talked about is the hospitality, is the, the hotels, the trade shows, the conventions. There's, there's relief in here for restaurants and, and um, for live events, but we need to do more um, in the hospitality, leisure and travel industry. So we're working on that. Um, I'm hopeful we can try to get something done in this package. If not, then uh, we are going to make it happen in, in, a, in another package. But, you know, at the end of the day, Tom, I tell you, this is what happens. Many people know this. On the floor of the Senate right now, um, this is how it works. This is how the rules are set up. The majority leader of the Senate controls the agenda. So the majority leader right now is Mitch McConnell. He decides what goes to the floor of the Senate for a vote. And we are hopeful that because there's bipartisan support for this bill, that he will allow it to go to the floor for a vote. Sure. One of the questions that we receive from our audience is, uh, is are um, not-for-profits included in the, in the PPP for this, this go round? Yeah, I, we didn't change any of the, the specific formula for who, who, who gets it. I think there's just more money for a second round of, if you got it the first time and you need it the second time, it will, it, there's more money for that. Um, sure. So yes, they should be, and I will check to see, but I, I do not believe that they, that was taken out. Great, great. Uh, you know, one of the, the priorities of the Vegas Chamber and the National Chamber is infrastructure work as it relates to, especially um, I-11, and certainly why we have bigger fish to fry today, no doubt. Um, what do you think the opportunity is in the, next con in the next Congress to get some funding to go forward on projects like I-11 or other infrastructure projects for uh, Nevada? I am excited about it because I think there is an opportunity. What I'm hearing from the next administration, rightfully so, they want to focus on an infrastructure package. I, I, you, you've heard me speak about this. I think this should have been done three years ago. This is something sure. that would be...
Folks, it looks like Folks, we're having some technical say. issues. Please stand by. There we go, Senator. All right, sorry. Some somehow they just just uh, lost the connection. Another what, reason why we need more money of our era, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say, this is this fits right into the infrastructure piece of it. Uh, sure. I am hopeful that we do have that infrastructure package for this very reason. Uh, we need more money for broadband. We need more money for um, uh, the work that we need to do um, through our Department of Transportation on um, just uh, it, whether it's roads, bridges, highways, uh, horizontal infrastructure, vertical infrastructure, whatever it is. And I'm hearing the administration is supportive of that because it just, it, it makes sense, puts people to work, helps us come out of this pandemic, re helps our economy recover, and it's good. It's good for the country. So um, I, that, this is another area that is on the top of my priority working with this administration to see uh, how we move forward. I will also say that's why both Jackie Rosen and I are very curious to see who's going to sit as the Department of Transportation. I've had a good working relationship with the current uh, Secretary of the Department of Transportation um, and uh, who, who has really listened on I-11, been very helpful and supportive, and I am hopeful that the next Secretary will be able to do more and get it that much further along. You know, the senators on, on both from both states, Arizona and Nevada, we've both been talking about this and figuring out how we can work together to the benefit of both states on the interstate. Sure, and and while the, the interstate is obviously a huge economic boon for the state of Nevada and, and really connects the two largest cities that aren't connected by an interstate in, in the United States, uh, to, your, to your reference point about broadband and getting that to our, our more needy, uh, uh, neighborhoods, I think that's critical as well. So we can move along. Um, can you can you describe what the opportunities are for some bipartisan legislation and and what that environment looks like and and where we're lacking in getting that going forward? Yeah, well, a, a couple of things. One people don't realize. I sit on five committees, and every single one of those committees, there's bipartisan legislation. There's work being done. It just doesn't get to the floor of the Senate. Uh, and that's been, uh, I think many of us, our frustration is why isn't this legislation getting to the floor Senate? Why are we not debating it on the floor? Why are not we not having amendments and being able to engage in that process? That's the impetus why I think this bipartisan group came together for this COVID relief package. They're just kind of fed up. I think many of us are, let's get something done. So there is, there is the opportunity. Um, we just need to make sure leadership is listening and willing to work with us to put it on the floor of the Senate. Um, I think that uh, for, for my purposes, every single one of my bills that I've introduced, I always look for a Republican colleague. I know that this is how it works. You find that common ground, you figure out who uh, on the other side of the aisle might have an issue in their state that would be similar to ours that might wanna get something done together. That's how it starts. And then you go work the house side of it and try to get it introduced there or talk with your colleagues there to see if we can't get some bipartisan support on the house side as well. That's gonna continue uh, and it's, it's happening now. Um, but we just need to make sure at the end of the day that we, it makes it all the way through so that we are actually voting these bipartisan pieces of legislation out of the Senate and out of the House and getting it to the president for a signature and getting something done. But I, I am hopeful, I think there's work to be done. And, and here's the other thing, uh, let me just say this. Good news is we don't need 100% of the, uh, the senators to support legislation. You only need 60, uh, depending on the legislation. So if there's 20 that I'm hearing on the Republican side right now that don't wanna do COVID relief or any more stimulus relief out there, then good, then don't do it. But still put it on the floor of the Senate because we could pass it. Uh, with more than 60 uh, and get it done. So let's do that. We don't need uh, this kind of unanimous uh, consent here for every single Senator. That's the whole purpose of why we debate things on the floor of the Senate. Sure, sure. 
Senator, you recently introduced two bills. Um, one is the Home Investment Partnership and the other uh, Reauthorization Act and the Housing Fairness Act. Can you tell us the status of the bill and kind of color in what the, what the intent of that legislation is? Absolutely. So I have been working for the last three, four years now that I've been in the Senate on the issue of affordable housing in our state. As you all know, it's been a challenge um, to build affordable housing throughout the state, depending on uh, where you live, whether it's an urban or rural area, the challenges may be a little bit different. But at the end of the day, it comes down to does that project pencil out uh, for the builder and everybody working to get it done? And that hasn't happened. It's not penciling out for some reason. So my goal has been to work with all of our, so many of our leaders that are already on this call to figure out what we can do working together with at the state and local and then at the federal level, what I can do to pass legislation uh, and bring the additional resources into the state. So this area is one. This one actually increases the home, um, the trust fund. Um, and so it increases it to about $5 billion uh, and then indexes it to inflation. What I've heard from so many in our state is that trust fund has been key to home uh, building these home and home ownership. And so I wanna make sure the money is still there. And then the uh, fairness uh, piece of legislation just addresses really discrimination, unfortunately, that we still see in housing, not just in Nevada, throughout the country. And we want to make sure that there's no redlining, that there's no discrimination, that people have the opportunity to own a home, no matter where you come from, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your, you know, your background. And so that's part of that legislation as well. I am working with my colleagues um, to get that passed and we'll work on committee. I am on the banking and housing committee. Uh, and uh, I have uh, been talking with our ranking member who is Sherrod Brown. Our, our focus is to go into the next Congress and instead of calling it banking and housing, call it housing and banking. Our priority is going to be affordable housing. And so my goal is to make sure that everything that we've been working on in the state um, at a federal level, what I can get passed to support our state needs is gonna get done uh, next Congress. And so you'll see more legislation around affordable housing. I'm working on a, a couple of other things right now and we'll make sure that you're engaged, you have an understanding of what we're doing uh, and um, can weigh in as well. Great, great. Hey, uh, one of the questions we got from our participants is, could you address the status of uh, immigration and, and how that's going? Yeah, so right now, um, actually, we've seen all of the court cases uh, that have really uh, addressed and kept in place both uh, DACA uh, as well as um, uh, the status for TPS recipients. And what you're going to see going into the next Congress that with the new administration, uh, I believe, or many of us are going to look to see if we can't do another comprehensive immigration package. I've spoken to so many uh, in the state of Nevada uh, on immigration issues, including in our rural communities with our ranchers and farmers. And so th this is something that we have to get right. And it needs to be comprehensive. We need to come to the table and sit down together in a bipartisan way. I know it can be done because the Senate had, had actually passed a comprehensive package, I wanna say in 2013. Um, so I think there's an appetite for many of us to say, okay, let's, let's work on this, let's get it done, let's work with the new administration, see if we can finally uh, start moving a comprehensive package that really addresses the needs of everyone. Yeah. Councilwoman Brown um, wanted to know if you could address the out-of-pocket cost uh, of the vaccine when it becomes available to the general public. Yeah, so there shouldn't be an out-of-pocket cost. So if there is, let Councilwoman let me know. Here, here's what's happening. Um, I've been on uh, conference calls with uh, Operation uh, Warp Speed at the federal level, the folks that are, are running it. And um, we appropriated $8 billion so that there would be no cost to anyone to receive this vaccine. And that $8 billion would be for the distribution of it and making sure it gets into all of our communities. Now, the other part of this is I'm hearing from state and local governments, including our governor and local governments, that there's additional money needed to help for that distribution. And that's what I wanna make sure is heard because at the federal level, when I was on this call with Operation Warp Speed, I asked them, what are you hearing from the state and local governments? What, what's the cost that they're gonna to need to distribute these vaccines? And they basically said, well, we haven't heard anything. Well, I know that's not right because I've heard and seen 
just the, the Governor's Association in a bipartisan way has asked for more money uh, for the distribution. And I know our state needs it. I'm talking with the governor, um, uh, Governor Sisolak, $10 million uh, is needed uh, for uh, the distribution and to get it out there. So I, I'm open invitation to all the uh, local government leaders if, if, if for some reason you're not part of that statewide um, uh, vaccine distribution plan and handbook that has been put out and, and uh, there's a cost associated, please reach out to my office. Uh, we are working on this right now. This is part of our push to get more money for state and local governments and our tribal communities in this next COVID relief package and in future um, packages as well. Sure. Senator, what do you think the top priorities of the Biden administration are and how do they affect Nevada and what are our opportunities and maybe what are our, our challenges under those, under those top priorities? Well, I know the top priority right now is addressing this pandemic, this healthcare pandemic and the economy that has been so hard hit because of the pandemic. Uh, we're not done. We, we've got to address this. We've got to turn this around uh, for, and you guys know it better than anyone. And, and so this is a priority, not just for the new administration, but for many of us. In fact, for me, I have been working with our um, hotel and hospitality industry uh, and US travel to really focus on how we uh, have uh, long-term solutions um, for getting this um, economy back uh, uh, turned around. And so I have legislation that I'm working on now. And I know this is their priority uh, along with the, what we just discussed still the PPE that's necessary, the testing, the tracing and the vaccines and getting the vaccines into our communities as quickly as possible. That's the priority right now. And we all need that. And then in the meantime, while we're trying to get everybody vaccinated, more stimulus into uh, our communities, uh, to individuals, to businesses, so that uh, we can turn our economy around that much quicker. Nevada is gonna be so hard hit because of the nature, I don't have to tell all of you, of, of the revenue base that comes from our hospitality industry. So we have to continue to invest in it. That's gonna be my priority. That is the priority uh, that the administration I know is focused on as well. Beyond that, I think it is about jobs, the economy, um, uh, workers, uh, it is going to be about our small businesses. It is gonna be an infrastructure package that we said, that we just talked about. It's how can we turn our economy around and create jobs? Uh, and transition into the jobs of the future with this new technology that's out there as well. So there's a combination of things that we'll be focused on. Uh, you know, Senator, uh, Nevada passed a limited liability law in the special session. Mm -hmm. Pretty proud moment for the chamber. We were pretty instrumental in that. And the, the folks of uh, like Paul Morakin and Mary Beth Sewell were, were instrumental in getting that along. And the governor even has, uh, remarked that but for the chamber, Vegas chamber, that law wouldn't have passed. So a proud moment for our, our accomplishments. What do you think the chances are of having some federal legislation that mirrors that or is similar to that? Well, we're working on that now. So there's negotiations going on now because of that. And that's, uh, and believe me, because of the work that you have all done in Nevada, as a former attorney general who respects states' rights, uh, I don't think the federal government should be passing legislation to preempt what you have done and create a whole new cause of action uh, in federal courts around this. That's just, it's not what is required. And, and that's why I oppose Mitch McConnell and John Cornyn's legislation on this. But there is a way that we can respect what the states have done like Nevada, still understanding that our, our businesses are, are concerned and need some sort of protection along with our workers and, and customers as well. There's a balance that, that we can find and those conversations are going on right now. Um, there are many of us have been talking about how we can try to put together some sort of an agreement that finds that balance and bring that to the table, because the one that the, the only piece of legislation that is out there right now, um, the, the corn and uh, legislation, which creates complete immunity, preempts our states, creates a completely new cause of action, is just not the right one. It's not something that I can support. Sure. I think one of the things we were proud of is, is that our legislation is fairly balanced mm -hmm. in that if, if folks aren't are bad actors, we're not there to protect them. Uh, but for businesses that are following the rules and, um, you know, the last thing we want is 
first of all, we don't want anybody to catch COVID, but that's just not part of a reality today. But if somebody catches COVID on Saturday and they test and they remember somebody coughed at the sandwich shop on Wednesday, I, I don't want to hold the sandwich shop owner, you know, liable for that. So that's kind of where we were coming from. Well, and Tom, you're right. And I think that's why we need to respect what the states have done. I mean, you really have come together, worked through all of the issues and the concerns and put together a good piece of legislation. And why should we come at the federal level and say, no, you can't, everything that you worked on, forget it. It's gone and we're going to create a whole new cause of action in federal courts. It's just, it's not what we should be doing here. Sure, sure. So uh, Raul Ra Martinez uh, asks, how do you feel about the level of oversight and transparency transparency on stimulus spending? Oh, I think there has to be. Uh, for the very reason that we see right now, there's so much um, uh, fraud, uh, particularly around the uh, the unemployment insurance. And th th listen, this is something I know as a former attorney general for state for eight years. Anytime there was federal stimulus, there were people that were going to game the system to try to figure out how they can access those that money fraudulently, it always happens. And that's why you need to have that enforcement mechanism. You have to have oversight. You have to have people watching what's happening. At the end of the day, um, for this uh, investment and all of the money that we have put into COVID relief, there has to be transparency as well. This is taxpayer dollars. Uh, we should be transparent on how that money is being spent. Is it getting to where we had intended? I know when I voted for these pieces of legislation, my vote was to get it to our small businesses directly, quickly, as soon as possible. And the data will tell us whether it got there or not, but it has to be transparent data because how are we gonna to learn to change it or modify uh, the formula if we need to, to make sure it gets to the businesses um, that are still struggling right now. And so transparency is, is key and it, it is so important. And that's why I support that oversight mechanism as well. Okay. Um, one of the questions we received from the from the audience is uh, obviously we, we've put a lot of money into the into the uh, economy through the federal government over the last year or so, and where where ultimately is that money going to come from? Is what the question is. In other words, I think the question is, how do we pay for the deficit and the debt? I think that's probably <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I think. No, it is something that absolutely should be on our minds. How how are we going to how, how do we address this? How do we address the, the increasing deficit and the debt? Now, remember, it was increasing even before this pandemic hit. Uh, and it's something we have to be cognizant of. But at the same time, when you're in the middle of a health crisis, a once in a lifetime pandemic that has just devastated, not the United States economy, but economies around the world, our focus should be right now on how do we come out of it as quickly as possible? How do we address it? How do we turn it around? And that requires uh, relief, disaster relief funds coming into our states. That's why Chairman Powell, the Federal the Reserve said, we need this money. It still needs to get into these communities. But yes, do we need to address after we come out and we've addressed the pandemic, the deficit and debt? Absolutely, we have to be responsible just like everyone else. There has to be pay for We have to understand how we pay for it and how we reduce the deficit and debt. And I know the new administration, this is something that they're gonna be focused on as well. Um, this question comes from one of our participants. Uh, he said, how do we keep publicly traded companies from getting PPP money? How do we keep, oh, so there, that goes back to the oversight. That goes back to ensuring that um, not only the oversight, but the transparency of it, and we're collecting the data to ensure that it's going to where it needs to, to go. And that's why, if you remember, we had the CARES package initially, and then we did another supplement to that. And when we did the supplement of additional money to the CARES package, we actually were more prescriptive on the formula of which businesses could receive it and how much. Um, that's why that data and getting it is so important to ensure it's not going uh, where it shouldn't. You know, are, are there any discussions out there on improving healthcare and what what would happen? Our, our uh, participant wants to know what would happen if the Supreme Court knocks down the Health Care Act? Well, it, it actually would dismantle completely the Affordable Care Act. That means everything that we have for those over 400,000 Nevadans that have access to health care because of uh, the Affordable Care Act, they would lose it. 
people would lose with coverage of pre-existing conditions. Uh, it would no longer be required that insurance companies cover pre-existing conditions. Preventative care, uh, that would go uh, by the wayside. So uh, it, it would really devastate our healthcare economy moving forward. And so that's why uh, I was so opposed to even this fight. It should have never gone this far because too many people across this country, too many Americans uh, have access to healthcare because of the Affordable Care Act. Is it perfect? No. Should we improve upon it? Absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, we don't take it away. Um, and if we, if there's a goal to take it away, then you better have a plan that that's better and improves upon it. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not happening right now with the current leadership. So yes, it is devastating. We have to focus on healthcare in this country. And and here's the other thing uh, that we have seen even magnified more because of this pandemic: behavioral health, mental health substance abuse, we have to focus on that. That is a priority and has been for me going uh, into the next Congress. I'm actually gonna be introducing legislation around um, kind of a, a, a continuum of care uh, that is necessary for behavioral health uh, in this country, including in Nevada. So uh, stay, uh, stay tuned, we'll share that with you if anybody is interested. But uh, we have seen now more than ever that we, we also have to focus on that behavioral health piece of it as well. Sure. Um, Lori Bean says, has anyone considered small business cre tax credits for, for relief from COVID expenses or revenue losses in lieu of SBA loans? Yes, we have. And um, they've been debated, uh, but they have not been necessarily included in any of the relief packages. In fact, this coming relief package, there is no um, relief associated with the tax code. I'm trying to change that because I think it, we, we've got to address some of that for um, uh, our businesses uh, in, in particularly that are affiliated in Nevada with uh, so many of our uh, hospitality, travel and tourism, but um, it, it's not there yet. It's still a negotiation and I, We'll see if I get it done in this package. I am hopeful, but if we don't, we're gonna to try to force that conversation uh, in the next package going into the next year. I sit on Senate Finance. We have oversight over the, the, the what happens in the tax code. So this is something that I am not gonna let go of. It is, it, we need that type of relief and additional help to our businesses, not just an injection of funds, but also how we can help them in other ways. So there's a, a cannabis bill uh, that was uh, proposed here in the, I believe in the Senate. And it's just, what are your thoughts on that bill and the uh, potential implications for our state uh, from dispensaries to production to consumption lounges? Um, you know, the observation is that these are great uh, source of tax for the state of Nevada. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two actually that have been introduced in the Senate that I support and I've been a co-sponsor of. Uh, for so many reasons. Um, and I'm hopeful we can try to get something done next year. They come through banking and housing and I'm gonna ask for another hearing. We had one hearing already, but now we're going to new Congress. So we're gonna have to reintroduce the, the legislation and have those hearings. I think it's important. I, 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 it is so important for our small businesses to be able to access our banking system uh, for so many reasons. Uh, for me as a former attorney general and then um, working with the current AGs, the, just the issue of, of uh, crime and, and money laundering and issues that we have concerns. Anytime there's a cash flow business and only cash, um, it needs to be addressed. But at the same time, our businesses that uh, legitimately um, are um, uh, operating because the state law said you can do this should have access uh, to the financial system and all of the protections, including under the tax code, like every other business. And so that's what these two pieces of legislation uh, do. I'm hopeful going into the next Congress um, that we're gonna be able to, to, to move these and that's something I'm gonna be working on. Right. Damon Schilling from AR Medical West or Medic West uh, would like to ask you a question. Okay. Darren, you're on. All right, good morning, Senator. Uh, just recently, the American Ambulance Association released a report that stated American ambulance, comp our ambulance companies are at a breaking point after receiving uh, so little COVID aid. That definitely applies here in Nevada. From north to south, uh, the Nevada Ambulance Association has talked and we're seeing a huge demand in PPE increased demand. 
uh, increase in isolation of employees as, and our employees are just getting tired just due to, due to this new command, uh, demand. Will there be a larger emphasis and focus on the front of the frontline employees in this next stimulus package? Yeah, well, I hope so. Here's what's happening. And let me just, because I'm going to pull it up for you to, to talk a little bit about it. For the healthcare provider relief fund, um, it's, they've set aside $35 billion. Um, and then for the vaccine development and distribution, 16 billion. I haven't seen, um, with, affiliated with those top lines, I haven't seen the language yet on how that's broken down. I do know that many of us have heard, uh, Damon, from companies like yours, uh, along with all of our healthcare workers who are just getting burnt out um, and they are not having uh, the ability to get the PPE they need. I, we, I'm hearing that in Nevada and I know my colleagues are hearing that um, in their states. So this is a focus for us to make sure that that relief and that those dollars are there. So as soon as I know the top line, and I don't know if I have any of my staff on this call, but we'll 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 look at the language to see how specific it is, and then we'll get back to you. All right, appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And then also on a side note for, for your mental health stuff, we work with the state of Nevada, the Nevada Hospital Association. Uh, on perfecting a lot of those um, are working on mental health. So we'd love to work with your office on what we're doing here in Nevada. So, Thank you. So uh, thank you for that. We have reached out to so many in, in the state to talk to them about it. We will absolutely reach out to you because I think it's important that we have the Nevada stakeholders uh, involved in this as, as we roll it out. Now, obviously it is national legislation, but my focus was on Nevada and how we can improve that care, behavioral health services and that we need. So thank you. Thank you. Senator, when the uh, PPP legislation came out, uh, there was you know, a big significant part of that is forgiveness of the loan if the money is used correctly. And the IRS has come out and taken the position that those uh, expenses that you use that money for are now not tax deductible. Um, do you think that was the intent of the legislation and is there a way to address that issue if you don't? No, that wasn't the intent of the legislation and that's why going into this next relief package when I talked about um, there's $288 billion that they've put into this kind of bucket for small businesses, the deductibility is there and that's for that very reason. I, um, and, I, and, and there's bipartisan support for it. Listen, we, we just had a banking hearing last week with uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Chairman Powell, and this came up, this issue and our concern. Uh, and it wasn't just, it, it was all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. So this is something uh, that is in this package that I'm hopeful we can pass. Great. Chris Davin uh, from the Henderson Equity Center would like to ask you a question. Chris, are you there? Chris, you need to unmute yourself. Chris, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, let's let's go to AJ from. Um, uh, oh, can you AJ's, hear me now? There we go. Yeah, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Sorry about that. It wasn't unmuting. Uh, thank you for, uh, for having us. Um, so my question is, is with nonprofits, um, I am the executive director with Henderson Equality Center. Um, you know, we are a nonprofit and, you know, being that nonprofits are, you know, almost 90% ran by volunteers, a lot of the different packages that are offered for nonprofits, you know, there is no assistance. Um, you know, to give you an, an idea, uh, Clark County uh, has issued round three of the grants. Uh, nonprofits are not allowed to uh, apply. Uh, the governor uh, offered the PETS grant. Uh, once again, uh, nonprofits are the last on the list to be funded. Nonprofits are, you know, on the front lines right now, you know, providing uh, food pantry assistance, mm -hmm. tutoring to help students with education. And, you know, there's nothing that's being offered to nonprofits. Uh, you, you, you went over your list of all of the businesses, but nonprofits aren't even mentioned. You know, yet we are the ones that are helping. And without the nonprofits, people are not going to have food or food assistance. So what can be done to make sure that nonprofits are being included? So the, the nonprofits are included at the federal level. I can't speak for the state and local, but at the federal level, nonprofits are included in the PPP. So have you applied at the federal level for either the disaster relief funds or the PPP and been denied? 
Yes, we were denied based on the fact that we do not have employees. The PPP okay. specifically states that a nonprofit that does not have any employees cannot apply. Most of your nonprofits are volunteer ran. So we don't qualify. And that was for the PPP. But what about the idle loans and the disaster loans? Let's do this, Chris, uh, because there's money. There's money for you. And there's money for if your nonprofit is actually uh, engage in a food pantry or uh, helping people who have food insecurity. We have a whole separate uh, tranche of funding for that that comes either th through the Department of Agriculture. So let's do this. I will have staff reach out to you and talk with you about where we can okay. find funding for you. And if it's not there, if there is a, a gap for your type of nonprofit, then we'll try to, to close that loophole. But let's talk, I'll have somebody reach out, okay? Okay, awesome. Uh, Senator AJ from uh, three, three, Third Eye Productions would like to ask a question. AJ, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. AJ. Please. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I have three questions. If they're unable to be answered, please have someone reach out to me. The first has to do with live events. I am in the live event industry. And being in Las Vegas, there's over 67,000 that are currently out of work, 12 million nationwide. With the CARES Act, I believe I heard you say that there will be more focus. When you said that, did you mean in reference to like there's specific funding just for the airlines or just for the hospitals? Will there be something just for live events? And so, go ahead, sorry. Adrian, I'm listening. Oh, I'm no, go ahead. And the second uh, part to that question is with regard to the idol. Do you know if that, if I know at one point they were allowing submissions or requests for increases, though they weren't approved, is there an intent to allow that to be improved? Or yes, approved, excuse me. Yes. So a couple of things that that tranche of, of that 288 billion for small businesses for PPP for idle. Also, there are there's legislation that's focused for restaurants. There's le legislation focused for live events for stages. Uh, the Stages Act will get that information to you. Uh, I'm curious under that legislation if you uh, qualify uh, for it. So we will reach out to you to talk to you about that. Um, and, and, but on top of that, um, this is what I'm working on. There is not money, though, um, to help our um, convention, trade show, and, and hotels. And, mm -hmm. and my concern is, after working with our travel industry, some of that relief can be through the tax code, through tax credits. If we were, to a or were able to get tax credits to support convention and trade show industry, to support um, entertainment um, uh, and uh, and um, the restaurant industry, our travel, to bring back the repeal, a uh, repeal of the limitation on the entertainment tax. There's things that we could do that could help our businesses as well. That's what I'm working on to try to get into this next package. Um, and if I can't get it now, I'm going to do it again in, in another stimulus package. But AJ, we'll reach out to you to let you know um, to see uh, if this next package is going to provide that funding for your business. And, and for anybody on this call, if we don't get to you today, please reach out to my office, my website. We'll, we'll share it with you, cortezmaster.senate.gov. We'll share it with you the information and the numbers. Uh, please reach out. And if you, don't, if you don't know, just have a question, reach out and we'll answer that for you, please. But AJ, we'll, we'll get back to you. Thank you. And my last question was regarding STEAM. I know a couple of years ago you attended the Girl Scout STEAM Career Conference. My company falls under that. We're an entertainment technology company. Are there initiatives within the uh, state right now or, or your office that are geared more towards STEAM and not just STEM? STEAM, you mean uh, legislation geared towards that? Uh, legislation or even um, some of the some of the acts like one of the ones that I know you were working on was the building blocks of STEM Act. Yeah. So I didn't know if there was something similar for STEAM adding in the, um, the arts. arts component. Yes. Now. No, I'm a big fan of the arts. Yes. 
So we have legislation not only uh, really focused on funding, uh, traditional funding that we always uh, fight for to make sure that we have funding um, for our arts, but continuing to support STEAM and not just STEM. Um, there's uh, the Workers Act, there's, there's legislation that I have out there that we'll share with you that, well, that actually works with our small businesses to work with um, some of our students and young adults uh, in this space. So happy to share that with you. Uh, in thank the future. You. And thank you for that work. That's that's so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Senator, I know you uh, have to get back to your job. So you have some commitments to come upcoming. So we want to thank you for being so generous with your time and insights into what's going on in Washington, D.C., and as well as our, the service to our state. We're we're very blessed as a state in that our, our entire congressional delegation is open to access to us and willing to share. And so if you didn't get your question asked today and or one comes up later on as you're thinking about our conversation today, reach out to the Senator's office and I'm sure somebody will get back to you and, and give you some relief or some insight as to what's going on. So once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Cox Communication is always so generous and supportive of the Chamber as well as Allegiant Airline, AMR Medic West, GC Garcia Inc., the Howard Hughes Corporation, NB Energy, the Porter Group, Southwest Gas, Sunrise Health System, Switch Communications, and Tory University. Again, thank you for all joining us today. We are uh, glad that you were here and thank you. Uh, be safe out there, okay? Take care of yourselves and be kind. With that, we're done. Thank you. And again, thank you, Senator. Take care. Thank you.